Okay, so welcome everybody to um, another one of our special uh, webcasts from Travolution. Um, and surprisingly, we're going to be talking about the market situation in regard to the pandemic and COVID. And actually, today we've got Carolyn Corder, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Dara, who I spoke to. It's get, getting on for a year ago. I think we spoke in April last year um, as the whole situation sort of hit. Um, we didn't know a lot about what was going to come up but now we do we've, we're a year in and uh, we've got a lot more insight into where the industry is and, and, and what we've experienced the last year so Carolyn's agreed to come back on and, and give us an update really from their perspective about what we've seen and what we might see going forward so um, um so to kick off um we've got a few slides which I will endeavor now to share on my screen which Carolyn will talk through uh, once you've done that we'll have a further chat we're seeing. So I'm going to press some buttons. Carolyn, over to you. Great. Lee, as you bring, Lee, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's always um, great to talk to you. You're bringing intriguing questions. And um, what I just wanted to share as we think about where we're going, uh, Adara's in a fortunate position. We see in a typical year about a billion uh, bookings, air and hotel bookings. And so while it's great to see uh, consumer sentiment survey as well. It's great to see how many people are going through airports. We get the view of what people are searching and what they're actually booking, paying money for. And so, you know, just as, as I was thinking about what we might want to talk about a year on since the last time we, we chatted about what travelers were up to, uh, we took a look at uh, some UK travel to get a sense of, of what was going on. And um, what we've seen in, in about travel demand, and it's been true throughout the whole year, is, well, if we ever had a question, are, are, is there pent-up demand for travel? The unequivocal answer was yes. Um, I can't remember whether you, or not, you and I talked about it a, a year or so ago, but you know, will the lack of travel diminish the desire? Well, certainly for leisure, absolutely not. And so what we've seen time and time again in the UK, EMEA, here in the US, is when there's a an opportunity for optimism. Uh, when we saw the vaccines roll out, when there were changes in, in the rules in terms of travel, there was always a, a, a boost in demand. And it, what you see here on this first slide is exactly that phenomenon. I believe it was February 22nd when there was an announcement uh, uh, about the, the path to, to normalcy, you know, what the path out of lockdown was gonna look, at, look like. So here on this chart, and this is for uh, UK searches and bookings. Uh, searches in purple, bookings in pink, and the you know with the following days after the announcement, it popped up eighty percent. So volume increased eighty uh, percent. People in the UK looking to travel. Now you see it, it comes back down and tapers off a little bit, but it's still at a higher level, uh, which I view as very optimistic. <clears throat> also, I I really track the difference, the ratio between searches and bookings. We've seen some instances where searchings really go up, bookings stay relatively flat or uh, low. And, and, and to me, that suggests a little less confidence about pulling the trigger and, and making the commitment. So just, you know, just on the, on the idea of, is there pent up demand? Are people eager to travel? Uh, like I said, we see this pattern over and over again. Um, saw the same thing when the vaccines rolled out in the UK, the, these spikes that accompany it. So a little bit of, of thought on human nature. I think the other thing we're seeing is um, travel, I, I'd say is complicated. And what you see here is taking a look at those bookings we just saw, we wanted to, to take break them down and say, are these people traveling individually, solo? Are they couples or are they families? And uh, what, you really, you know, what, what really stands out is, and, and typically we see a much uh, a better balance or a, a more even balance between families, couples, and solos. And, and so this is unusual to see solos dominate 57% of those bookings. And, and my sense is it reflects um, the complication around travel in terms of, well, maybe I'd want to travel with my partner, but he's vaccinated and I'm not. Or the people we want to go visit, he wants to visit folks and they're vaccinated. So all the complexity, um, you know, aside from, um, you know, managing, uh, kids that are in school or other elements has, has just gone up a level. When, when we started this, um, or a few months into it, we saw some countries opening up. We thought about air bridges between countries. And so we were, we were looking at what would it be travel country to country international. That and, and uh, you know, outside of Asia, that, that's still 
fairly well dialed down. And then we saw different regions allowing travelers in or out from different regions. Um, and, and so when, what I feel like we're getting to is something that's much more at the individual level. And so it's gonna be people that are vaccinated are gonna do certain things. And, and so I think it's, it's gone from a global country level to a region level, and now it's breaking down to, well, what can you do um, as an individual, as a couple, as a family? And, and there's different obstacles and different complications as you sort that out. And then on this last slide, we want to think about well, where people are, go, are going. And so what we see here is um, UK origins of people in the UK uh, flying internationally, and then people within uh, continental Europe. And uh, it's not included in the UK outside of uh, so, uh, Europe without U UK. And what international destinations are they going to? And I think this is a really interesting combination um, because First, it's ranked, so from top to bottom, Spain on top, Bangladesh on the bottom for UK origins and where people in UK are flying to. The next column is, is there, what's the change in rank? So Spain and US have been super consistent. Compared to 2020, that's the exact same rank they had last year. And then that final column is the percentage increase. And so you see countries that are more associated with you know, going to visit family, going for a homestay, Pakistan and Bangladesh really popping up. The other ones are fairly consistent in terms of what you'd expect of, you know, the overall we're down 60 to 80 percent. I think Turkey's interesting. They've been um, more active uh, advertising and encouraging people to come and making it easy without tests um, necessarily is, is one of the latest things. And so you can see they've moved up the rank one, one point. And then for uh, where folks in continental Europe are going, Spain and U.S. still top the list. I think, you know, interesting to see Brazil on that list. Um, interesting to see Italy on that list um, for um, continental Europe and not, oh wait, no, they're on both, yeah. So Italy dropped three points for the UK and only dropped one point, uh, one rank point for uh, continental Europe. So just some interesting thoughts about where people are gonna be traveling to. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, some, some, some good insight there. I thought the first um, chart, that, that gap between search and booking is, is, is interesting. We see, it, we see it at certain times, it's extremely close and then it widens slightly. Is it, is it from your, uh, your experience, is the gap historically big at the minute in that it does, it does reflect a lack of confidence or are you surprised by how close those two, those two measures are? For, for that chart I just showed, they're pretty close. We've seen things range from, you know, pretty typical search to booking ratio that we see in our ecosystem is, you know, seven or eight searches per booking. <clears throat> in the wider ecosystem, it can be larger. Um, over the course of the year, I've seen it grow to 13, 15 um, uh, searches per booking. And so to me, that, that suggests, okay, people um, enjoy looking at where they might be going. It's, it's a bit of armchair traveling. It's, you know, they're checking to see what the fares might be, uh, not ready to commit. Yeah. It's, it, it also does reflect that the airlines, uh, and to their credit, have made it a lot easier to change plans. And so some of the historical rules of thumb about you know, what the right book, um, search to booking ratio should be has been shifted by you know, the, the flexibility on the part of the airlines as well as hotels. But if I you know, look at it over the course of a few months, and if I begin to see the, that gap widen, <clears throat> to me it's an indication of, okay, there's, there's uh, optimism and, and a desire, but not the the readiness to commit yeah it's, it's definitely the case there's the pent-up demand element and and, and it, interestingly i think you know say a year ago when we we're talking about about the situation we we would have been talking about um i guess economic issues and and about the fact that you know, the, the two big things that have happened on the governmental side on covid is you know, protecting the economy and protecting the jobs and most countries particularly most wealthy countries have um, invested huge amounts in, in that but what we're looking at now is also alongside that is the vaccination program. So you've got two, two streams which are taking us hopefully into a more positive future. And that on one side, the economy is being, being put into sort of uh, intensive care in many ways, but hopefully with the result that it will come out in a better state. So that means that people will have money to spend on, on things like travel. Uh, and then the vaccine program sort of enables that to happen. So I, I guess from a year ago, we can look at the prospects in a, in a much more positive light a we know the you know the economic help has had an impact and secondly we hope that the vaccine rollout is going to have an impact yeah exactly i i, I think um uh it, it's 
not to put too too rosy a picture on it, it's still quite dire, right? We're still down 60%. Um, but I think we have this feeling of, okay, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, I think the consumer sentiment, when, when I look at the charts, what I detect in it is this, the sense of, um, you, you, one, of the, one of the things, of the many things that, that have been prevented or, or rest, we've been restricted by in, in the pandemic is traveling. And so I think it's even created a sense of, uh, maybe there are people that even feel I didn't realize how much I'd miss it. I didn't realize how much I would miss going home and visiting my family and having petty little arguments with them, but darn it, I do. Mm. And, and so um, this idea of, of really cherishing this idea and, and being even more grateful for the idea that we can travel, I think is something that's come up. In terms of the economics, uh, we're able to see, uh, in terms of the types of travelers, we get a view of, are they people that have uh, tended to travel a lot in their in their pa in the past in the past couple of years are they road warriors? Um, do they tend to spend on luxury travel, or are they more price sensitive, less more casual travelers, less frequent travelers? And it's been interesting to see those those mixes because um, in the early months of the pandemic we saw a lot more of those casual travelers uh, that tend to be deal seeking. You know the fares were relatively low, and so you know, the cost wasn't so much of an issue. Um, really taking root and, and dominating uh, the, the mix in terms of who was traveling. And my suspicion was those tend to be people that were younger. Uh, a lot of the destinations they were going to were Las Vegas and Miami, places that were congested. If this was here in the US, we saw the same things in Europe. And, and so I think there's, you know, watching the, the, I also draw optimism from watching how the, the shift in terms of who's traveling is taking place. And uh, starting in November, planning for the winter holidays, we saw more of those, um, luxury travelers come back into the market, folks that had, um, are used to traveling for business. So I, I also take that as a positive sign. What, what, what do you think over the past year, sort of brands and destinations, the advertisers that you deal with, what, what, what have they learned about operating in a very uncertain climate? Because, you know, last year, during the summer in this, in this part of the world, we saw, yeah, we saw some opening up and then closing back again. So we saw a lot of difficulty in terms of planning your, your marketing, planning your messaging. But actually, that looks like it's going to be true going forward. It's going to be more maybe driven by vaccine rollout and you know, the opening of some corridors and the use of vaccine passports to allow travel. But, but it's still the same situation. It's just going to be very unclear and a bit, a bit fragmented and, um, and, and the situation can change. So what, what, what do you think the industry as a whole has learned about um, adapting its approach to marketing in, in that kind of environment. Well, I, I have to admit that I'm a bias since uh, Adara's a data company, but I, I have seen it, if, if um, in terms of where you want to be in the travel industry when something like this happens, being in the data business is is, is a great is, is a, one of the better positions to be in mm -hmm. because I've seen just a, an increase in the appetite for uh, for a desire to to um, understand the nuances of how people are going to travel because you're absolutely rightly. The, the doors, we, we saw regions and, com and countries open and within a week shut down. Yeah. You know, there were folks in the UK on holiday back, uh, I think it was October, November. And, and all of a sudden they had to buy tickets and get home quickly because it looked like things were gonna be shut down. It was gonna be difficult, Not, you would get home, right? But, but there's a sense it was gonna be complicated and difficult. And so with all that volatility, I think the, the um, uh, even though I've seen smaller brands become more sophisticated with how they use data, how they think about it, um, how they uh, track markets, how they look at demand. Um, and so I think it's, it's forced all of us to be much more agile, much more nimble um, and, I, I, and, and, and have a, a, a larger focus, right? Because um, you know, if, if you were Italy relying on travelers from the UK and the UK shut down, well, maybe you should start looking at other markets. And so it's really uh, encouraged the industry to, to reevaluate and rethink where should my, you know, which segment should I be attracting? Where should my, um, where should my demand be coming from? How might I attract demand from other places? Um, Maldives, uh, um, I saw a, a pop in their, in their bookings. And I just went, okay, so that's a, a smaller area what they've been doing. And, um, and I had been tracking it, but then I, I went and looked back and you can see just ad after ad after ad, particularly uh, focused on the UK. And you know, I, I can see the bookings, I must've been a, a very effective campaign. Yeah. And so you can see those examples of how people have really zeroed in on 
potential markets and been able to execute well. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, in the UK, we find ourselves in an incredible position in some ways as being the uh, the source market of choice, uh, and that's because they think we're, well, we are going to be largely vaccinated as the adult population, but by by the peak travel period, and, and and it looks like a lot of other source markets aren't going to be um, quite there yet. So, so we're suddenly being um, wooed by virtually every country that thinks they can be pretty much open by the summer, which is a which is a great pleasant position for this market to be in. But um, on, the, on the other side, there's still that uh, there's still those questions about the, the safety of travelling, even with vaccines, and, and especially around you know do you have to get tested and uh, vaccine passports. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and, and, and I just wonder how travel companies and brands need to address those you know understandable concerns um, in their marketing and in their in their messaging. Because it's not so much a price-led thing anymore; it's it's more about the softer issues. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I, I think it's 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 a really interesting shift in terms of. Uh, you're right. It's not just if, if I'm a destination and I think about who who I want to attract, um, and if I you know, if I've got issues around a health concern of, of 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 the population, the region I'm attracting them to, then yeah, all, all of a sudden you're you're the, the demand equation has shifted yeah. <laughs> in terms of. You know, you as a traveler are, are much in demand because of um, the way your country's rolled out vaccines and the proportion of people that have been able to get vaccinated. So I think it's an interesting shift. And I think that that balance of, um, uh, the, I'll call it the quality of the tourists that you're attracting, it echoes a little bit what we what we really folk and will continue to be focused on, but um, sustainable tourists. So the idea that, that there were regions that were really interested in attracting people that would come in off season, people that would stay longer, people that um, you know, maybe had a, a lighter footprint or a lighter impact on, on the destination. And in some ways this mimics it in terms of um, you know, countries are going to, or regions are going to be competing for those um, travelers that I think are going to be, uh, you know, if they have concerns about the, the health, public health of, of their own region that are, are gonna have um, a lighter impact. So yeah. I, I think I, I think it's a tough balancing act. Um, I, and I think it'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. And you, you know, there's still, as you say, there's great uncertainty. I think the variants, concerns over how the variants and whether vaccines are effective against those, yeah. um, you know, not, not yet clear how that's gonna unfold. And I think, like you said in your uh, the slide on the mix of travel types, it, 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 it's down to individual sort of equations and beliefs and um, how they how they want to approach their their, their travel, um, which which can be very difficult. Well, well, in the US, I mean, you know, in the UK, because of the vaccine rollout, I think there's increasing optimism and increasing um, support in the idea of us getting back into travel again. Um, as something we can do safely. What, what's the sentiment generally in the US? Um, we, we always get the impression in the UK and Europe that the US traveller, when there's a crisis, tends to be the one that sort of rolls back and stays within the US more and is the, is, is the lat, you know, comes back later into international travel. But, I, but I've actually seen a few things where I think the Spanish tourism board is going to be targeting US travellers for the summer um, we did a, a session recently on the Balkan region, and they and they were quite positive about being able to attract U.S. travellers again because of, they expect um, the degree of vaccination to be very high among the U.S. population. So, are are are, are Americans looking to do that international travel again, or they, are they reining in their ambitions on travel and staying within the borders of the? <clears throat> I, I think it's the latter. I, I think they're they're you know ready to travel again. Just in the last. You know, as the vaccinations roll out, we've been tracking international bookings. And just in the last um, six weeks, they've gone up uh, almost 2x. Okay. Now, from a very low base, but you know, that's a substantial increase. I think part of that is, uh, and, and it's this um, you know, a, a little bit of a barbell. You've got the folks that are older that are vaccinated, and they've got the time, the flexibility, and, and you know, probably have, they're, they're now four or five trips behind where they thought they were going to be in terms of travel, so they're eager to get out there. Yeah. And then we've also seen um, younger folks that uh, feel less vulnerable and um, even taking longer vacations. This idea, of, uh, we adopt, adopted the term work from home, WFH, and also began to mean work from Hawaii, 
WFH as well. And yeah. so this idea that, that um, it's an opportunity for folks that are earlier in their career that maybe have uh, fewer commitments um, at home that, that they're gonna be traveling. So I think we'll see, we're definitely seeing the uptick in, in demand. We haven't parsed it yet to see you know, who exactly is traveling, but it won't surprise me to see those two uh, populations um, you know, be, be very prevalent. We're also seeing, um, and uh, my colleague David Morrow likes to call this revenge spending, but we are seeing upticks in um, the, the luxury hotels. And so when we look at the mix of economy, uh, full service, uh, upper class and, and luxury, now luxury is a relatively small part of the market. So the fact that goes up isn't gonna pull the whole market with it, but it does suggest that um, people that have been able to spend their travel budget over the last 12 months have, have you know, feel a, feel a, a um, I won't say entitled, but uh, are, are comfortable with splurging out and spending it um, on this next trip. And then the other uh, bellwether or uh, indication that I take is from, from the marketplace is uh, here in the US, uh, Starwood Capital um, uh, and uh, BlackRock um, made a $6 billion purchase of Extended Stay America. Yeah. And they mentioned this, this idea of, you know, that's a little bit about get back to work. Maybe it's people that are also choosing to um, uh, you know, move where they live, but my home office is still there. And so I'm going to be there three days a week. Um, and also they do have some resources in the portfolio that they were touting as you know, a, a, great, um, uh, a great element of the asset of the portfolio. So yeah. I think that's not indication. It's interesting to watch what consumers are doing, um, watching you know, what Wall Street and, and what the uh, people with money are doing is the other part of the equation. Yeah, we, we uh, clear, clearly that sort of uh, long, longer booking and higher basket value. We, we, you see that everyone sort of says that's what they're seeing, even even with domestic. I've, I was talking to a, a supplier of technology to small, medium sized hospitality businesses, and they were saying even domestically, we're seeing people book for longer. And partly, like you said, because they've missed out on a year, so they want to get that proper week or two weeks in um, and they're prepared to pay a bit more and have a bit more more luxury and then and then you're going to have that really from the supplier's point of view and air, you know airlines are going to struggle to fill those business class seats so, so, so aircraft um, seats and inventory is, is going to be targeted at the leisure market and they're going to try and find those guys who who want to spend the money they've not spent so far or for the last 12 months on travel and and, and really upgrade so that, that that's interesting but I think as we pointed out or spoke about in the last time we spoke you know, you, in order to target those people, you're looking at what the historic data might tell you, but actually some, in some ways the historic data doesn't tell you a lot anymore. It's, 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 it's very much out of date. So um, get, just give us an update on how you're helping, you know, companies. You say you're in the data area, but, but it's very difficult, I guess, when you haven't got anything to go on because you haven't got past, past behavior or experiences to really give you that steer. How, how's, how are you helping companies to make sure that they are targeting the right areas? You're absolutely right, Lee. And, and we're seeing that in terms of um, the, the, the scoring algorithms that used to help you determine which audiences to target are, are broken. You've got to uh, re rerun those, rebuild those uh, mm -hmm. to be effective. And so we, we have seen that um, you know, people are, are interested in new ideas. They're relying more on the, the fresher data. Um, they have, you know, a lot of these companies have large CRM databases, large loyalty bases. And so they're looking to go to people that they know, but knowing which of those people are in market is really the tough part. And so, you know, we're, we're uh, excited to be with a uh, data consortium or where the partners uh, that participate, you know, we're able to, to give visibility in a privacy appropriate way uh, to people that have intent for travel because narrowing in on people that are actually gonna travel is, is really tough these days. You know, it, it's, it's a smaller part of the population. So the idea of uh, having the right data, having the data science to, to rerun the algorithms, rebuild uh, the machine learning programs, to be able to target them, to be able to determine what the right offer is, because um, you're right, there might be people out there that are ready to splurge, spend their budget, there are others that are gonna be going for a long period of time. And, and so the message to those people are radically different. The other thing that's happened, and so for us, it's, it's the pandemic on one hand and the changes in privacy on the other. And so you know, with Google announcing the deprecation of cookies with the change in how uh, people will be tracked um, across websites, how that information is gonna be used. 
Um, the, the, the model that we operate on, a consortium model where there's partners, where the data is permissioned, uh, we're dealing with first party data with a really strict um, data rights management uh, foundation, uh, we think is, is one of the ways to, to solve not just, okay, who should we target, um, who's in market, but how do you do it ethically? How do you do it in a way that, that reflects um, rising consumer expectations for how you're going to manage their data? So yeah. we're, we, we feel quite fortunate that um, because we, we, our DNA is a consortium, our DNA is in that data ma rights management area, uh, and that this is where the markets move, that we're in a position to help our clients with, with that part of the equation, as well as the, we call it the who and, and the what. You know, who's in, how do you predict the privacy? How do you know that you're talking to Lee, you're interacting with Lee, and the what, what do we know about Lee so we can be relevant? That, that, I mean, you obviously bring up a really interesting area for everybody in marketing in a minute with, with the demise, really, of third-party cookies. It's uh, it's going to change a heck of a lot of what people do. And also, it's going to make brands want to um, you know, get more get more for what they, they spend on their marketing. And, and, and you know, they're going to have to. Their budgets will be, will be constrained for a while after, after this. So, so they really are going to need to know that they're, they're doing the right things at the right time for the right customers. It's not going to be a question of just pushing everything out and seeing what gets through that, what comes through through the, through the funnel. So, how 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 do you see this kind of move towards a more precise way of marketing develop, um, you know, going forward, given given what's happened in the last twelve months? Uh, well, I, I think it's going to be it, it, it'll uh, it'll be a real shift. You know, I I, I still remember Y two K and all that. You know, it went smoothly, but all the effort that went into ensure that everything was properly coded and adapt, adopted, adapted. Um, you know, it was a significant effort. And I think this is equal in terms of the, the, the shift. In fact, even larger in terms of, you know, what it means for privacy. We see all those, the fines almost every day or every week, there's a multi-billion dollar fine for Facebook or Google for violating the privacy. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of, of what it looks like to go forward, I think, um, you know, brands look at it and, and you know, of course there'll always be a role for Google. And of course, they want to be able to operate on the Google or Facebook within the wall, you know, what will uh, become even more higher walled gardens. Um, for larger brands, the idea of, um, I, I'm going to rely on, on Google and the others for the, the marketing plus the measurement. You know, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a black box. Yeah. Uh, so I think there'd be real demand for approaches that have transparency, that have control in, in terms of, you know, I want to be able to understand if I spent a million dollars on marketing, um, I, I want to see the details of how that performed and then control it, dial up this segment, dial down that segment. And so I think, I think it's a really interesting um, point in, in our, in the evolution of marketing to see what those different, uh, you know, how those different approaches evolve. You know, Google, uh, Facebook and others will continue to evolve in terms of what they offer. Um, our approach with the consortium is one that we think is a, a, a winner and, and has um, you know, good attributes and good benefits. Yeah. And then there you know, continue to be other uh, mechanisms using clean rooms and the, the idea of a cohort and getting smarter about how you define those cohorts. Um, you know, that will continue to be, I think, an, an element of, of how we go forward. The challenge for travel is always, always and I don't know if it's huge different to other sectors. I think it is really, but the, the, the conversion rates in travel are very, very small. You, you have a lot of basically unproductive traffic that you you paid for often, you know, quite high value just to come to your site and then it just yeah. disappears. So so then you focus on those very small number of people who do convert because they they're suddenly they're your customers and the, the other people you don't count as customers, but that, that probably has to change now, doesn't it? If you paid for those numbers of people to come to your site, they've done something on, on your site, you've got something on them, you've got some data, some insight, they, they, they kind of are customers, even though they're not transacted. So it's about, you know, treating your entire audience as your customer base rather than the people who just book. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. And I think that the idea of, um, you know, that's your audience, to the extent you can enhance your understanding uh, with, um, uh, partner data that you that you have and its permission. Um, you know, we we've seen that uh, you know somebody comes to your website knowing that they're part of your loyalty program, knowing that that they have been searching, maybe you know knowing that let's say it's a hotel site, knowing that they've already booked an airline ticket, 
you want to treat them very differently or you know, having a, a, a propensity they've already booked the airline ticket. You, you want to treat them very differently than, than somebody that doesn't have those attributes. Yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, you, you, you've been in the, in the industry, not just in the data side of the industry, you've been in the industry some many, many years and you know the industry how it works. And there's always that continual um, battle between brands going direct, using third parties, and, so on. and that, that's going to continue because the, these are sort of commercial imperatives in business for distribution. You know? I, I, wonder, I just wonder, you know, we're in, in, into this a year, uh, we, we've, we clearly see a move towards, from the customer, you know, for reassurance and trust and looking for information and advice, and that, that is really well provided by third parties, although, you know, often third parties are the ones who, you know, they do have the customer relationship, they don't own the product. And I just wonder, have you got any thoughts a year into this, how, how that dynamic is playing out? It's probably different in different markets, I'm sure, but where, where, where do you see that dynamic moving in that kind of that battle between the third party distribution, the product owners and the customer? Well, I, if I look at it historically, um, you know, the 2001 downturn or 2001 um, you know, terrorist attacks, 2008 downturn and this pandemic, 2001, 2008, the OTAs um, gained ground significantly in, in both of those instances as um, you know, their, their model, you know, being able to surge um, a little more price sensitivity was really well-tuned to what the market was looking for. I haven't seen that same bump in this instance, and I think instead it's gone to the likes of Google. So that the, the, you know, the OTAs are in, a, in a, are in a bit of a squeeze in a tougher position between what the brands can offer, which is you know, that, that more direct connection, and what I can get from uh, Google, Facebook, and the others. And so you know, there's certainly a place for the OTAs and, and, um, you know, and the metas. I saw you know, Kayak uh, has a hotel now down in Miami. And, yeah. I, and for me, that was only a matter of time you know, in, in terms of you know, how things cross over. And I think that's an exciting development. And, and so you know, the OTAs are, are a significant force in a, in a you know, major dynamic in, in the marketplace, but you didn't see the same increase in share, the, the same um, uh, shift in dominance relative to the brands that you saw the last time. And I think that's been picked up by, by Google. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've seen our first Amazon supermarket open in the UK in the last few weeks where you just you walk in and take your goods and automatically pays without using a, a cashier. So, you know, you are, you are seeing that o o o very much online native brand becoming more, uh, more a more offline feel to it but there's a lot of there's a long tail of offline um and non-traditional to online tra travel agents out there do, doing doing pretty well out of this because they have been able to look after the customer in, in what's been a yeah, really difficult time so you know there's a potential resurgence there as well i guess no exactly and, and by the way i i um there's a few well actually i was traveling so it's over a year ago i went to one of the amazon go stores and it is really a uh, unsettling to walk out of the store with yeah. with your bags and not paying. It's, it's, it's an odd experience, but uh, a good one. Yeah. Um, let, 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 let's just finish up by, um, by by taking a bit of stock. I think. I mean, uh, I, I guess a year ago when people were trying to predict what was going to happen in, in very difficult circumstances, everyone was coming up with scenarios from from best case to worst case. Um, that now we're a year in. What where, where do you think we've come out in the end? Um, uh, are we sort of in the middle between worst and best case, or or did things pan out worse than you'd hoped a, a year ago? Um, the the rule of thumb that I've been operating on is for every month we're down, it's three months to to come back up. Okay. Uh, and that that's kind of a little bit of the rule of thumb, and so tracking against that we're probably uh, not too, you know, that, that still seems to be the, the consensus, not too far off. The, um, I think the vaccines, at, at, you know, when we spoke a year ago, the outlook for the vaccines wasn't as optimistic, or, you know, there, there wasn't much of an outlook at all. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the vaccines, I think, really changed the uh, dynamic in a very positive way. The um, you know leisure is coming back. We're seeing a little bit of business travel, actually a fair bit of business travel coming back. Um, you know the last piece of the puzzle will be the meetings. Um, you know again the vaccines. I think about cruise lines. They know the first and, and were really uh, seriously hit. <laughs> and ironically, they may be in a very good position if everybody on board is vaccinated. Yeah. Um, you know it's a very different experience. So um, 
I, I think my overall take would be the, the um, uh, we're, we're in a better position than I would have expected when, when we had the conversation a year ago. Still a long slog to get back to where we were, but um, you know, we, we can see that the vaccines are, are fundamentally shifting the, the timeline. Yeah, and and finally, do you think do you think sort of getting back to normality is a reasonable expectation in a in a reasonable time frame, or or do, or do you think you know normality? We don't actually know what normality is going to going to be here. I mean, you, know, you mentioned cruise. Um, we've just had a, a launch of a P and O cruises in this country. You have to be vaccinated to go on board a cruise ship. That you know, that that is not normal, and whether that's always going now going to be the case going forward, we don't know. But but things may have changed forever, I guess. Yeah, I, there are some things that definitely have changed forever. Um, you know, I, I look at it in terms of the, the basic human desire to travel is wrapped around the desire to connect with people you care about and the desire to explore. And sometimes, you know, those often overlap. That that DNA hasn't changed, and that'll still be there. In fact, I, I'm um, in the first few months of the pandemic. It was interesting to me to see people. Uh, that there was so much traveling to places that were congested. I mentioned Las Vegas and Miami. And, and I think of those people as you know, either resilient or stubborn and people that make plans and are, are you know, gonna carry through on them. And, and so I think that, that fundamental human drive is, is still there. I think that, um, you know, I, I look for some of the silver linings of the pandemic. I think there's been a, a change in uh, some of how we view service, how we, you know, what does luxury look like? Is it two or three people that are uh, available at the concierge desk for uh, help, or, or is it something else that's, um, you know, that's more technology driven? Um, I haven't been flying much, but, but uh, a friend of mine was telling me that uh, for flights that are two hours, uh, they're no longer running the cart through the aisle yeah. because just too much congestion. And they said, oh my gosh, that made the world a difference in the flight. It was quieter, it was calmer. If I needed to get up and stretch my legs, I could. And so I think that, that we've discovered some changes in, this, in the service mix um, for luxury, for how we use technology that are gonna stay with us. You know, contact list just makes lots of sense. Yeah. So um, some of that that we've discovered we like better um, in terms of carts in the aisle, I think will stay or it will be part of the change. I think we, for business, I've, it does seem there's a reevaluation of uh, which trips really need to be taken. You know, the idea that, that We've all gotten really accustomed to Zoom as we are here. And um, you know, so some of that may pick up some of the slack, but I, I think in general, there's a, the, the, the human nature is, is the larger part of the equation. Yeah. And, and as opposed for, for this part of the world, just to really finally, um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to the, a second summer during a pandemic. It's difficult to see, um, uh, you know, uh, positive, really positive prospects for a second, very disrupted summer season because that, that is clearly where you know, most of the profit in this in the sector is made. So um, we're looking forward to, to to hopefully having as normal as summer as possible. How, how how crucial do you think that is going to be for the industry's health, really, going forward? That, that, that there's some form of decent summer coming up. Yeah, you're you're, you're right. Um, summer's critical, and we're talking. You know, this is being the recovery is being led by leisure. Um, so I think that the timing of summer is gonna be one that's, that's uh, or the, the ability to travel during summer is gonna be, uh, is gonna be critical and important to the industry. Um, you know, though I, you know, we have noticed that people are, even families are taking trips during what would otherwise be the school year. Yeah. And so if, if, it, if it shifts a little bit, a few weeks here or there, I don't think that's too damaging. Um, if for whatever reasons we need to go yeah, ho certainly hope not, but for every reasons we have to go under lockdown through December, then I think it's a, a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like it's going to be quite a late booking market. Um, if, if, there, if there is a, to be a big market in the summer, it's probably going to be a very late booking market as people just, just hold off. So, so again, the onus is back on you to understand the data and the intent there. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. We're already seeing bookings begin to, to generate for the summer. So, so I think you're right. There so, certainly will be some people that hold off. But that desire to have something, because uh, you've seen in the news, people think fares might be going up. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are, are expecting that we'll have a, a more normal summer and are acting as if that's what we're going to have. So that's good to see hit the books.
Look, we'll, we'll, we'll close it off there, Karen. And th th thanks for insight. And um, and with things changing so quickly, maybe we should do this more, more often because- um, Always a pleasure, Lee. Happy <laughs> yeah. to do that. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there's so many things going to be happening in the next few months worth keeping a track on. So, um, and I know you you do that regularly with your own um, your own webinars and putting out data and insights into the industry. So, so thanks for that. Um, and we'll close it off now. So thank you, Carolyn. Um, all the best. And we'll speak to you soon, I'm sure. Great. Thank you, Lee. Cheers. Thanks.